Hi, welcome everyone uh, on this gorgeous Monday morning here in Santa Clara on the Open Networking Summit. Um, we are having a session today, a tutorial session on uh, interoperability, um, which is a, a really uh, hot topic, uh, affects open source, and uh, we feel it really important to talk about it. Uh, we will start with a really short introduction that who we are and for technical reasons we will all do this uh, sitting down <laughs> to avoid the uh, slides in our face. So um, my name, I'm Ildiko Vanch, I'm working for the OpenStack Foundation. I'm the ecosystem technical lead there. I'm uh, working together with our uh, member companies and um, community members to um, help them be successful with OpenStack as a, as a software package and also with OpenStack uh, as an open source community. And uh, beyond this, I'm also involved in, in OPNFE. I'm an OPNFE ambassador as well. Um, and uh, I'm really passionate about helping the cross community interactions and collaboration. Okay, I'm uh, Carsten Rossenhoeffel, Managing Director and Co-Founder of EANTC, that's the European Advanced Networking Test Center. Um, uh, we are an independent commercial test lab and I, my role is I'm a CTO basically at my company and I'm also a standards rapporteur at the ETSI NFE Industry Specification Group. Thanks. Um, so my name is Christopher Price. I'm uh, elected board member of OpenStack and OPNFV uh, and I work for Ericsson. Um, and today I'm bringing a vendor perspective to interoperability um, to try and put some balance between what comes for free and what costs us a lot, I guess. Good. Should we progress? Yep, please switch slides. I have an own secretary today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, we thought to bring you uh, the big picture before we go into the details that how open source, uh, the vendors and the uh, users, operators and service providers um, are um, placed um, on this big picture, what's the relationship between them, uh, what's the uh, responsibilities of, of each group, and I would like to ask Karsten to uh, introduce uh, the diagram uh, that you can see uh, behind us a little bit before we go into discussion. Sure. So, so the big picture, right? So what's the big picture? And probably all of you are aware of one or more or many testing initiatives that are going on in the industry. You know, everybody's testing these days, which is wonderful, you know, for, for a long time, uh, you know, we've been the lab rats. And, you know, if you've, when, as soon as you said, like, oh, we need to do some testing, hello, testing, quality assurance, people say, like, yeah, we'll take care of this in the last few weeks before we publish something. You know, it sh it'll, it'll all be good. So now in this industry, testing is really at the forefront and gets much more attention, which is wonderful. And now we need to create this big picture. Like, uh, how does everything fit together? You know, because if testing, we, we need to make sure that testing is not like fireworks, like, you know, boom, test event here, boom, POC there, you know, boom, some, some plug fest over there. Uh, we need to make sure that all of the initiatives work together and integrate in a way that the industry actually benefits. And that's the reason for this diagram. Um, basically, a testing pipeline we think is needed or you know forms actually as we speak um similar to like the the pipeline of coding you know um opnfe would not just take like oh, let's reinvent uh, code that openstack has done before you know there's this whole notion of um uh, taking um into account taking into account uh, upstream projects code and feeding rec uh, experiences and so on and we think the same needs to get in place with the testing. You know, you need to take into account testing that has been done by other entities before, and you need to, you need to provide feedback to, um, to upstream testing initiatives to make them better and more automated. And th that's basically what this diagram tries to explain. So um, basically, it all starts with open source testing, open source initiatives, and then um, commercial Implementations are derived from open source typically, most often these days. So uh, the commercial implementations need to be tested. Uh, once that is done, uh, industry-wide interoperability needs to be tested across all of these different initiatives and implementations. And in the end, the operators, the service providers, do their own testing. Usually, at 
this point, they do a lot of testing. You know, you are probably aware of the, the big uh, North American operators programs of integrating NFV solutions. It's massive testing effort. And uh, the problem with that is the more we get on the, to the, towards the right side of this diagram, the more expensive the testing becomes because everybody is doing this in their own service provider premises and everybody is, you know, recreating the same experiences. So the idea is like, um, Test plans need to be upstreamed over time, like the purple arrow pointing to the left, um, to basically transport that testing experience to a place where it's uh, where testing can uh, be better integrated and where it's cheaper because it's only done once instead of a gazillion times. And at the same time, uh, the here it's green, there is yellow, uh, yellowish. <laughs> anyway, so um, that that's the reason for upstreaming tests to reduce the cost and the effort and also the time it takes to do this. At this time, I, I heard from, you know, some unnamed sources that uh, it, integrating virtualized network function into, into production takes typically like a year or more. And that's surprisingly long. And in order to reduce this uh, experience that service providers are seeing, we need to implement this testing pipeline. And the last part is, uh, of course, on the blue arrow pointing to the right, the integration level increases. Not all testing can be done on the far left side of this diagram because naturally, you know, uh, the more you get towards the uh, service provider implementation, the more individual, the more integrated, the more end-to-end -end the solution becomes. Yeah, do you want to say something? I was, I was, I was going to add a little. Um, I think one of the things this diagram sort of presents that we're going to get into a little bit more today uh, is that each of these blocks has a different owner or a different responsible entity. Um, open source testing, it's, it's very much a community-driven activity. Commercial integration, um, that's, that's a vendor responsibility. Um, and then the industry-wide uh, interoperability is, is cross-vendor and, and other neutral parties. And then you get to the operator-led uh, integration at the end. Um, what we, what we see, or I think what we would hope to see coming out as we move into an NFV environment is that there's less responsibility split between these. Uh, the arrows sort of indicate that, that things need to start to flow one way or the other. Uh, and NFV provides an opportunity for us to do that in, in that historically the operator led individual testing was installing boxes, plugging in cables, putting power and so on and so forth. In, an, in, a, in a virtual environment it can be uh, running a script. Uh, and, and that's when you can start to do this sort of thing. But in order to be able to run a script, there is a, a, an ocean of work that has to go into creating an environment where that script will actually work. Um, and I think that's one of the things we're going to dig into a little bit and sort of talk about how we're getting there. Good. Yep, thanks. Uh, I think just one more thing to, to mention here is the importance that no matter where you're sitting, I mean, which part of the pipeline you and or your company are uh, representing, we all have our responsibilities in this pipeline and it's it's not one box that will carry all the burden and uh, the others will uh, use and benefit from it. We all need to do our own uh, work in order to make interoperability happen. All right, so we will go through uh, a little bit um, on this pipeline and we will start with the open source interoperability parts, what we can do there, why it is important. We can switch one more slide. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, we have this tutorial today because we said that interoperability is important, but why do we need to have a tutorial about it? Why is it not that simple and easy? Um, because you would think that, okay, we have a few tests, we, we plug things together, it seems to work and it will be all fine. Um, which could be like this, but um, it's uh, way more, more um, complex than that because whenever we get to um, an open source component that's kind of a base um, of our systems uh, more and more nowadays, uh, we would like it to be uh, modular, flexible, uh, we would like to configure it in various ways. Um, and therefore, when we get what we want, we get all this flexibility in it uh, and we can just use it as a box of Legos uh, in our environment. We have to realize that um, 
uh, validating and uh, verifying that it really works, it really does what we want to, the pieces are really fitting together, becomes a, a really, really um, difficult game to play. Um, because whenever you change a configuration option, that will change uh, behaviors, that will change how things integrate together, and there are just so many things that can, uh, let's say, go wrong or, um, or make the process that Karsten just, just mentioned uh, maybe even longer than that year or, or two. Um, therefore, we, we need to look into uh, what we would like to achieve, uh, what problems that creates for us uh, in the field of interoperability, uh, what challenges we have and how can we solve them. So you can just see uh, a few examples mentioned that, that how we figure out policies, how we make them discoverable, uh, how we can deal with, for example, release cadence, um, which is always... Um, a topic in the discussions because obviously we would like to have new features and, and all the bug fixes and everything out as soon as possible and uh, as quickly as possible. So when, for example, we are talking about a six-month release cadence, sometimes that even that sounds a, sounds a, a longer period, but um, when you look at the open source part as the base component that someone has to productify and work on it, then it turns out that the release cadence, even uh, a half year one, can be really, really fast, which can result in uh, many versions uh, and many release versions in production, uh, which have to uh, be able to um, talk to each other and uh, interoperate with each other, which uh, gets a, a really, really challenging problem when you uh, face it and uh, try to do it yourself. I just want to add, uh, so the release cadence is important because it, 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 it dictates how the industry has to react. Um, and and it's, it's a good point. One of the things which helps with a fast release cadence is stability. Um, we, we talk about OpenStack as, as not being usable and so on and so forth for many years. Uh, it's seven years old now. It's reaching a certain level of maturity. And, and, and thus, you can start to adapt to the changes that come through that community and are exposed through the community. I think one of the challenges we face across the industry is that not everyone's as mature as OpenStack at this point in time when it comes to, to the cloud environment. Uh, so the release cadence is really important. A shorter release cadence means less change from a, how do I adopt and into work with this? Um, but then it also means that I have very short cycles that I have to get out into the network. And, and as we talked, we still don't have all the pieces in place where we can go to an operator network and run a script. And, and if I'm gonna do something every three months, I'm gonna need to have everything automated. Um, anyway, sorry. No, thank you. It was a, uh, it was a, um good extension to what I said. And uh, as you mentioned, OpenStack, uh, we can switch to the next slide. Um, so I, I brought here uh, OpenStack as, as an example for you because as Chris mentioned, we, uh, we started uh, to build the community and to build the code base uh, seven years ago. Uh, it started with uh, I think our first big event was 75 people, and then six years later we had uh, 7,500. Uh, we have millions of lines of code and thousands of uh, developers uh, and, and engineers uh, working together from all around the globe. Um, so as the, as the years uh, passed by and uh, the code base uh, started to grow, and not just the code base, but also the functionality uh, that the, the software package provides, um, we had to realize that we uh, need to um, think about interoperability uh, and we need to take on the responsibility uh, of the open source side. We need to help our uh, ecosystem and ecosystem companies who are working with the software uh, to be able to ensure that what we are producing and what they are uh, putting into production um, um, that meets uh, the certain levels of, of quality and uh, they will be able to build it into, into bigger systems uh, as easily as possible. Um, therefore, um, the community and, uh, and the foundation created um, a working group, uh, which is today called Interoperability Working Group. Uh, the mission of this group is to uh, ensure uh, interoperability and uh, 
work on work on the uh, testing uh, initiatives uh, of this. Um, in this working group, now we we have obviously the whole community involved. Uh, it's a public activity, uh, fully open. Uh, but beyond this, we have the OpenStack board and the OpenStack technical committee uh, actively working in this group. Um, so it's really uh, something that we think uh, we are all responsible for, um, and uh, we take it as a as a high priority activity. Um, it was founded in uh, late uh, 2013, and uh, by 2015, uh, we got our first guidelines produced uh, because this group is working on um, creating guidelines uh, uh, and not uh, implementing the test cases themselves uh, on the first place. Uh, the guidelines are con consisting of a uh, list of uh, capabilities uh, that the software needs to provide. It identifies uh, code parts and components uh, that has to, has to run. And it also identifies tests uh, that it needs to fulfill. Um, and uh, these guidelines, and whenever a software component fulfills uh, the guidelines uh, that this group provides, uh, it means that, that, for example, the distribution that a, that a vendor provides can use the OpenStack logo because we say that, that they fulfilled uh, what we identified as requirements, uh, and it guarantees you uh, that you will get what you expect from, from that platform when it gets deployed, uh, and you will access the, uh, the APIs. Um, this group uh, works with a, with a tool set. So if we switch one more slide, uh, this is called RevStack. Um, this is integrated into our uh, Tempest framework, which we use as a, an integration test framework uh, within OpenStack. Um, so you can you can run the interoperability tests uh, as part of that framework. Um, the tests are usually uh, run locally uh, on premise, and uh, the the results are uploaded uh, to our website and stored in a in a database and gets evaluated after that. And um, whenever um, so, okay, one step back. The interoperability. Um, Interoperability Working Group uh, produces a new guideline every half year. Uh, it covers three OpenStack releases, and uh, the board and the TC are voting on uh, what goes into the guideline and what uh, tests uh, are going into um, into the test suite. Um, and um, these are the tests that, that you need to run uh, against a certain uh, version of OpenStack. It gets uh, the APIs validated, and uh, I think later on we will go uh, into that, um, that what are the uh, aspects of testing and uh, what, what do you want to get tested. Uh, for OpenStack, uh, we are testing the APIs, and we are testing the uh, user-facing APIs. Uh, which is important to mention. Um, so, for example, you will not uh, find anything within the test suite that, that would be, let's say, an admin-only uh, API, for example, or something that's intentionally pluggable, um, like, for example, middlewares or, or drivers. Uh, you will only find there what's, what's user-facing, uh, what everyone is able to access. Um, who has the uh, product uh, access. So just to chime in, on, on the RefStack or, or the Interop Working Group uh, outcome, uh, as, a, as, a, as a vendor, that, that provides you with a guideline and it, and it provides you with a dialogue with other vendors where, where you're able to sit down and agree, this is what we will all support. We will all make sure that these capabilities are presented when we have an OpenStack logoed product. Thus, as a consumer, as, a, as an operator, or as someone building onto OpenStack, it doesn't matter whose cloud I'm running against. It doesn't matter who is vending it. I, I can trust that I will have these user-facing interfaces. Um, and, and this is the first 
point in the entire value chain where we start to establish some sort of trust between the consumer and, and what's being produced. Um, so it's, it's really important. There you go. My input. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but um, OpenStack is, um, is just one piece. It provides an open source cloud platform. Um, you can use it for private, public clouds, uh, or part of a multi-cloud environment. But uh, you can also um, look at it as, a, as part of a, of a bigger system. Um, um, so if we switch slides. I can just hand back the mic to, to Chris, and uh, we can uh, look into how OpenStack fits into the bigger ecosystem. We will touch on, on OPNFE uh, and see how this all works out. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the OPNFV CVP, um, Compliance and Verification Program. Uh, we kicked this off last year from OPNV in order to try and achieve what OpenStack is achieving, to try and achieve a level of trust and certainty about what it is that we're producing. Um, so the, the CVP is, is set up against a set of fundamental principles um, and objectives. The objectives, I guess, are the most important thing. We want to essentially uh, help build a market. Um, we want to try and reduce risk for operators and end users. We want to make it easy for people to consume um, what we're producing in OPNFV. And, and as with OpenStack, the RefStack toolchain, to produce an automated way of building trust with a consumer. Uh, OPNV is slightly different than, than OpenStack, though. OPNV, we have opinions about who our customers are and, and what we're trying to serve, which are a little bit more constrained than, I think, OpenStack in general. We, we are trying to address the telecoms market. We are trying to address NFV. Um, thus, we have certain expectations around what the control plane should do. We have requirements around how it should be deployed. Uh, we have requirements around how uh, an application should behave when it's on the platform. Um, and we have expectations around what the platform should actually look like that it's running on. How, what, what is the hardware? How is it configured? And so on and so forth. So our CVP is maybe a little different in that, in that OpenStack provides you with a way of, of, of producing trust for a consumer. The OPNV then takes that to the next level, which is how to build a way of starting to establish characteristics of a system which can then be trusted. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit moving forwards. Uh, I wanted to talk back as to, to where the CVP came from. Where is the foundation for the CVP? It's a great idea. Let's do, let's do some sort of standard way of doing stuff. It's, it's hard to do that just at the outset. So we have been in OPNV building a lot with our upstream communities. We work a lot with the OpenStack testing. We work with Open Daylight, with ONOS, uh, OVS, with FDIO. Um, and we, we take those tests and we integrate those tests. So when we spin up a, a, an OPNV-based data center, we then run many thousands of tests against them, which are primarily coming from upstream communities. Uh, we don't carry our own code, or we try not to carry our own code. So all of our code is based on upstream, and we contribute back upstream. Um, so if we're working with OpenStack, we're writing code in OpenStack, and we're consuming that. Uh, and our test cases are very much aligned with the OpenStack testing. So we pull Tempest, uh, we pull Rally, we pull Robot, we pull a number of different test frameworks, and then execute them in an NFV context. So what OpenNFV does essentially is it takes a lot of open source software, provides an NFV context for it, uh, and then allows us to automate validating that software in that context. Um, and so this is sort of an overview of the test framework that we have in OpenNFV. Um, you know, we have we have the compliance activity which we're incubating today, um, and the dovetail is the, t the project we use for that. And then we have a number of functional testing activities uh, based around a, a, a common framework which we call Funk Test. Um, and furthermore, we do a number of performance testing uh, where, where we can either be doing data plane testing, we can be doing resilience testing, we can be doing failover testing, um, which, which fit into another bracket, if you like. Uh, and then we have tiers through which these tests can, um, can start to build. Um, at this point in time, we're still relatively young as a community. We don't have the seven years behind us that, that, that OpenStack have. So a lot of these are, um, I guess, not as well governed as they potentially could be, which is why we're still incubating our CVP activity. But it gives you a general idea of, of what we have as far as a testing foundation is concerned. Um, what we're trying to do then is between that framework and the little map on the right is, is actually representative of a project we call Pharos. That's our hardware labs project. Um, we have a number of labs you can see spread over the globe, um, and, and what a Pharos lab provides is a fixed infrastructure that 
complies to Opie NFV's view of an NFV cloud, um, that we can run any particular composition of a, a stack software against. Um, so what we do there is we deploy, uh, we test, and we iterate. Um, and we deploy, and we test, and we iterate. We build data centers on a daily basis. Well, we build hundreds of data centers on a daily basis. Uh, I remember I was, I was on the, the keynote here a couple of years ago when I was able to claim that we'd spun up 1,700 clouds by the time this uh, conference was on. Um, I couldn't even imagine what that's like today. We've, we've grown uh, considerably since then. But what OpenFV does is it builds a cloud up. It tests, it validates, it makes sure that the features that we want to see in that cloud are there, and then it tears it down and starts again um, with a slightly different flavor, with, with Open Daylight or with ONOS or with OVS or with FDIO. Or, uh, we, we're able to, to basically integrate all of these into a cloud environment. So we deploy, we test, we iterate constantly. Um, we use Etsy um, as, as a, a very good reference for how we should be testing and what we should be testing. We in integrate that into our test activities. Uh, we also take IETF test standards and we use those in the same context. So what we're trying to do is, is take what's happening in the standards world and apply that to what's happening in the open source world in a telecoms context so that we start to do this, this real-time integration uh, and we start to prove things very quickly. There's a cycle though, because we do this over and over again, we're able to evaluate and then we're able to improve um, and then we're able to iterate again. So, so every time we find a fault or every time we find something new, we push it back upstream. If we're gonna write a test case for an OpenStack feature, we will generally um, potentially do it in our, our own repository to start with, but eventually we'll push that upstream to, to, to OpenStack um, as quickly as we can. Um, so we have this cycle going round and round where we've been able to uh, improve the quality of our testing um, and improve essentially the quality of what it is that we're testing for telecommunications environments. Um, and what, what we get out of that is, is we get a very good knowledge of how to use OpenStack, um, how to work with Cloud Native, how to use op uh, Open Daylight, KVM, um, how to work with Linux in an NFV environment, uh, what it means when I have different Linux distros with KVM and another, uh, you know, guest operating system on top. How does this behave uh, in different scenarios when I compose different components together into a platform and run it in a telecommunications context? Um, what it further provides us is a way of upstreaming that because if, if we go back to OpenStack, for instance, and say, hey, we've been running these tests and here's how it looks and here's what we're trying to achieve and here are the faults we found, then it's very clear for them to understand why we're trying to make a change or why we think this is a problem um, and then we can work very quickly with them. So. The CVP, as we move forwards, um, we plan to release this year uh, and have our first CVP. Um, when we release that, we, we hope to be releasing that with a number of upstream components. And RefStack, of course, the tool chain that, that OpenStack provides, gives us a really neat foundation for the cloud testing. Uh, and we're working with the Interop Working Group to try and identify if we need an NFV-based variant of that um, that we can, then, we can then adopt and use. Uh, and that's an ongoing discussion, I guess. Um, so hopefully what we see happening then is through the OPN of VCBP, we can then have an NFV reference in RefStack for OpenStack that people can use in their own contexts. Um, because at the end of the day, it's not all about one project or the other. It's about all of these projects figuring out how to work together. Um, so that's, I guess, the CVP in short form. Um, the other thing, guys, if you've got any questions, just raise your hand um, and we'll be happy to take them where we, we're trying to be conversational. Um, I speak fast and I get through my slides fast, so you'll be leaving early if you don't stop us and ask some questions. Not that that's a good thing, mind you. Yes. I do have, I don't know if it's a comment or a question, hopefully it leads into a discussion, but it seems like even from the very first slide, you're assuming that operators are going to wait until Ericsson or some other vendor comes out with a release of, say, OPNFV, and then we're going to start a testing process to start looking to possibly deploy it. Are you also looking to try to pull these same operators in immediately and have them be collaborators up front such that you don't deliver a car and you go, they go, well, yeah, but I really wanted, didn't really want a manual transmission. You know, I'm, I'm worried that there's still this, this concept of the, the, the long pipeline. We're going to have this full release and we're going to get it to the operator and the operator's going to go, well, this is great, but it isn't. We're going to have to figure, out, figure out a way to make this innovation work versus being a part of the process of innovation. Is that what you're no. here, or are you still looking to try to find ways to get operators into the pipeline earlier? Uh, we've, we've absolutely found ways, well, no, we haven't. The operators have absolutely found ways of getting into the pipeline, um, and, and everyone's very happy about that. I think 
to I want to flick I'm going to flick a bunch just to go back right to here because what what we have is a traditional flow right a traditional flow you've got you've got these lines and and we sort of talked about trying to blur those lines a little bit in that what what we might be doing uh, for the operator-led individual testing previously, we want to start to push that back up the track. Um, we do have operators, we have AT&T, for instance, heavily invested in open daylight and using that in their network and, and contributing, um, contributing test cases. And we have, we have AT&T and OPNFV contributing test cases uh, and, and actually helping drive a number of the feature projects we have there. Um, Orange uh, is, is a really good example of a group that have invested a lot in testing in OPNFV. The, the structure of that test architecture um, has a lot to do with a guy called Morgan Rickon from, from Orange France. Um, I think what we've actually started to do already is break those walls down. We still have, from a commercial perspective, there are still gates we have to pass through. Uh, but what we're managing to do is shift the dial a little bit as to who's involved, where, and when. Um, and I think that's, that's, it's, it's a really good question because if that wasn't clear, I think it's something that we're trying to sort of project as well um, as we move forward. And I just um, wanted to say to this point that you mentioned, uh, for example, AT&T, uh, we have them in OpenStack as well. And um, so when we are talking about open source, uh, yes, it's, uh, it's a com these are communities uh, consisting of, of developers, but uh, the developers are in most of the cases uh, employed by companies like AT&T or Orange or <coughs> Ericsson or all those uh, ecosystem companies. So it's not, this, this pipeline is not really like, there is open source, which is some kind of a cloudy blurry, we don't know what that is, and then uh, the vendors come, and then the operators come. Uh, this is whole of a, of a mixture. So open source also provides a place for the vendors and the operators and service providers uh, to collaborate. Uh, in one place, so they can uh, uh, way earlier in the process uh, share their feedback um, and um, um, participate in the process. Uh, so open source uh, does not only mean open code base, it also means the open, open testing uh, initiatives. So uh, we also would like to encourage uh, all of you to come and participate, uh, find these groups, find where the activities are, are ongoing, uh, and help us uh, to, bring it to bring it to the next level. And also, um, Many of these companies are running uh, these open source uh, releases. Uh, just you know, download it from from GitHub uh, as uh, proof of concept installations and and in labs. So it's not it. I think that in most cases it's not true that they see the whole thing um, as a, in the form of a distribution as uh, for the first time. They already tested it in labs. Uh, they already tried to uh, figure out w what it's capable of, how they can use it. Uh, they will just not put the, the pure open source version into production, uh, but operators will uh, work uh, with vendors uh, to get the distribution, get it in deployed, managed, supported, um, and all these sort of things. Um, that makes the business run. So, I don't know what what your view is, but uh, but actually, I think the operators are also getting way more involved in the whole process now recently with the virtualization again. Because a couple of years back, you know, we've been around for like twenty five years and we've done a lot of transport network testing, um, and you know, in the MPLS transport times, the operators got very how do you say in English laid back. So basically, it's like okay, uh, the whole industry will do their ga their game, and in the end, we'll just buy what's available, and that doesn't work anymore. And I think. It's, it's very um, reassuring to see that the operators try to get involved in this whole pipeline at as early as possible. And you talked about open source. I can talk about Etsy standardization. Operators are very active there and trying to steer things. Of course, everything has a horizon. You know, at at day day one, an operator probably doesn't know exactly how to deploy a 5G mobile core in two years from now. So there will always need to be some testing on the right hand, right hand side. Uh, by the way, there are, there are still a few more seats here if you want to get seated. Even I mean, the first row, obviously, but also here on the second and third row. We don't bite. <laughs> <laughs> Not often. Um, so I did want to, uh, so just, just to sort of sum up where I was 
coming to and going from. Um, there's a couple of initiatives that I, I wanted to call out. Um, there is an initiative called XCI, which is which is ongoing today, um, and that that goes from OpenStack to Open Daylight to OpenNFV to FIDO to OVFs. It, it's across almost well, not almost, but where, where intention is to be across all of this. The intention of that initiative is that we establish continuous delivery from open source projects, um, true continuous delivery from pro open source projects, and then we have continuous integration in their consuming entities. What that means is that any given day, at any given time, I can spin up the latest software from Trunk and run it. Um, and, and that's critical because what that enables is the next thing that we're working on, and that is uh, not as mature, you won't see any stickers or anything around, around it yet, but there is a cross project test strategy initiative spinning up. So the plan there is that if I happen to be writing some code in, in FDIO, for instance, on the forwarding plane, uh, and, and I'm targeting you know, an, an operator's central office deployment, then I should be able to push a patch, and my patch will go into Garrett, and that will run a few jobs, and it will start to build, and, and the continuous deployment will kick in, and that patch will eventually, not, not in seconds, but minutes to hours, make its way into a, into a data center solution that is actually deploying and validating that feature end to end. Thus, I have the ability to have a test chain for any patch that I push that validates that patch, no matter what component it happens to be in, end to end in the network. Um, these are kind of huge activities. Uh, they're, they're not huge in the context that there's millions of people working on them. There's a, there's a, few, there's a few small groups really starting to incubate this, but the change that they can bring into how we approach these types of problems is, is, is enormous. Um, so I'm playing audience for a moment. Yeah. Is, is that going to be a bag of rice problem? You say this in English as well, you know the bag of rice f trips in China and then nobody cares. But in fact, you know, if, if you would in, in include a small change in some, some open source code and it basically starts rebuilding the whole test for all OpenNFE flavors and Open Daylight and Onos and Open Contrail and then it comes, gets into OpenStack and basically the world's servers will be busy for a week because of one line of code change. How, how do you manage the whole flavors of configurations? Um, through, through intelligent planning. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's part of the, it's, so I, I talked about continuous deployment before I moved into continuous integration because understanding how the continuous deployment feeds into the continuous integration and how that stepwise chain approaches to the point where you get that end-to-end -end solution is really important. It's not, it's, as I said, it's not seconds, it could be minutes to hours because you don't necessarily want every patch to propagate through the network. You want to be able to do that in a managed and maintainable way. So essentially what you do is you do set up a cadence across all the components that enable them to have a trustable um, cadence of, of deployment and testing um, that then everything sort of feeds into in a, in a manageable way. It's not done yet. It's a work in progress and I don't know how it looks. A I cool can't idea. explain it today. <laughs> so hey. we did, before, before I move to the next slide, I wanted to ask some questions um, just briefly. So. It's good to know who you're talking to, and we haven't actually asked yet. Um, so if I, break the, if I break the audience up into I, I, I am an operator, um, I am an NFVI vendor, uh, I'm an application vendor, or I'm none of the above, um, could you just sort of raise your hand so that we, we, know, we know who we're talking about? So if you work for, for an operator who's going to be work operating uh, telecoms networks? Cool, OK. Um, for an NFVI vendor, someone, someone selling cloud platform? <laughs> just, just keep raising your hand. Who is that? And then for application developers, do we have any application developers? And a number of none of the above. Feeling very, <laughs> very lonely. Yeah, a number of none of the above. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks, guys. So that's kind of the open source world. It's it's moving fast. It's it's extremely exciting. There's a lot going on. Um, but the challenge comes when you sort of move into commercial interoperability. It's fine to solve everything in the open source world, um, but then, then we need to move into the point where we have maybe more accountability. And, and for this, I'm going to hand over to Carsten. OK, thanks. So uh, just a quick intro slide. I'm not sure how many of you know EANTC. So we're an independent test lab. We mostly test commercial implementations. We test them both together with vendors and with service providers and also with enterprises and governments, but that doesn't play a role here. So um, we're seeing commercialized implementations typically in NFE of open source 
projects. So basically a vendor X takes OPNFE implementation or takes an OpenStack implementation, modifies it, exp expands it, amends it by proprietary um, aspects and then releases it. And then then we get to, to test it. So uh, we can move to the next slide. Didn't want to put too much propaganda to you. So basically I tried to uh, summarize the state of the NFV industry and of course it's non-authoritative and I also don't have like a, a huge amount of uh, public data that I can throw at you. I, we do have some some experiences from NIA that I'm going to talk about later. So basically if you look at uh, the left hand side, that's the probably familiar Etsy reference diagram. It consists of the NFE infrastructure in the bottom paired with the virtual infrastructure management. So these two typically come together. Uh, then there are these blue VNFs, which are the virtualized network functions, together with their element manager, which manages uh, the virtualized network function at the application level. And on the right-hand side, there are two green uh, modules, functional blocks, which are called VNF manager, VNFM, and NFE orchestrator. These two together are often also called the Management and Network Orchestration MANO. And then on top of this sits uh, the big white elephant, which is called the Next Gen OSS, which nobody really knows about yet. Um, so anyway, so what are we what are we looking for? And um, that's on the right hand side. We're looking for interoperability, of course. But then th the other big question here is performance. And we didn't talk about the types of testing. Maybe we can do this later on. But interoperability is wonderful. And that's like the, the, the bare bone, what you actually definitely need as a mandatory precondition to get anything running. But uh, the question number two, basically the next morning, will be how efficient does a solution work? Because if you have to substitute like a, a two rack unit traditional firewall with like two full racks of x86 servers, that's not going to fly well. So uh, efficiency and, and scalability is the next question. And then uh, the one after that, especially for for telecom operators, is high availability. And I think that's where, I, I, as far as I can see, there is a, a quite a substantial difference uh, between how enterprises use OpenStack and how service providers use OpenStack, with you, because service providers are in, into a different way of high availability. They don't just so like, okay, any service can die at any moment. They have to understand exactly like which service dies exactly when and how do our customers continue doing their stuff, uh, even while it's dying. And um, and then, of course, the big new thing is manageability. I think that's basically what the what the business case um, lives and dies with. Um, in a multi-vendor world, the whole manageability of getting uh, services instantiated, torn down, migrated, moved around data centers, uh, getting service chains of you know virtual firewall plus virtual uh, router service spun up. Uh, all of this is governed by manage management in solutions. And uh, so manageability is a topic that we see much more as a testing focus than in the past. In the past, transport network, you know, people just either used command line interfaces or they used their homegrown management implementation, and that doesn't work anymore. Okay, we can go to the next slide, and uh, basically, this is going to build into different flavors of how to deploy this. The first and most simple flavor is to just buy everything from one vendor. And actually, I, I was surprised, but there are some service providers out there who follow this model. So, um, for example, I'm not sure if, I think that's public, but I'll be careful here on the microphone. So there is uh, one, one uh, pretty well-known uh, service provider in uh, Western Europe, in a mid-sized Western European country, and they just buy everything from one vendor. And um, so they said, Actually, it works fine. You know, it, we're, we're happy. We're happy people, you know, for now. And uh, we buy the infrastructure from the vendor. We buy the VNFs, mobile core, and everything from the same vendor. We buy the management from the same vendor. And we also buy the billing systems, the management systems, the OSS from the same single vendor. And of course, you have a very clear responsibility in this case. There is no finger pointing. Uh, there is no questioning of like, why doesn't it work? It's, it's very clear. And uh, I tried to represent this uh, with these little smileys on the right right-hand side, basically, to say, like, b both on the performance side and the on the high availability side, on the advanced functionality side, it's it, 
it's pretty much uh, well understood by some solution vendors out there, not you know huge amounts, but there are quite a few uh, that understand the game and are able to implement it. The problem is this is not what most service providers started with as a thought, like why would we even want to virtualize? And one of the reasons was to you know, buy best of breed solutions, be more agile, be more flexible, um, and not also not be required, not required to issue RFPs for the whole network and everything in one piece. So that's why I think the majority today try to go at least for this model, which says we still buy a lot from the same vendor, like the infrastructure and the Mano, and maybe also the next generation OSS, but uh, we reserve the right to buy VNFs from different vendors. So that's the first level of integration that almost everybody in the industry is seeing right now. You have an infrastructure, you have a management, and then you need to integrate VNFs, plug them into this environment. And these VNFs can be you know, virtual routers, virtual firewalls, virtual DPI, virtual mobile core, policy management, you name it, all of them. And uh, typically the RFPs go out and then there are a couple of implementations tested and plugged in. And that's where I would expect the solution to still be quite well interoperable. It's, it's a straightforward game, I think. But in fact, uh, that takes service providers often like year, a year or more. And uh, we had an experience in, in our lab, you know, we don't normally cancel tests, right? So we get into testing projects, we run tests, we write a report, and in the, then sometimes there is a second round if something fails, and in the end, mostly it, it works. But uh, we've actually had one or two tests which were formally canceled because of the finger pointing between the VNF and the NFVI vendor. You know, like, oh, this is your fault. No, it's no, it's yours. No, it's yours. No, it's yours. And uh, that's that's what can happen in the industry. We'll talk about NFE ITI, which is one way to prevent this from happening. But um, I think I'm still pretty confident on uh, on some aspects of light multi-vendor, uh, like the the service agility and functionality is good because you can choose from from different VNFs, but uh, manageability might be more difficult because the element managers from different vendors have to plug in with the with the orchestration, and uh, also the performance usually is a, a big question mark because uh, that depends on on exactly this like multi-platform, multi-flavor testing to really work, and even the small change of a BIOS parameter can throw people back, you know, a couple of days <laughs> in, in testing. Okay, so the end goal, as far as I see it, would be like a total of four plus vendors in, in this environment. And um, basically, typically, you uh, service providers buy infrastructure from one group of vendors or from one vendor, uh, Mano from a second vendor, and the VNFs from other vendors again. And in this case, of course, there are a couple of interfaces that need to be multi-vendor ready, uh, especially the one on the right-hand side are the more difficult ones, the one between the Mano and the infrastructure. Um, the industry starts testing that right now. And uh, as you can see, there are a couple of red smileys, but there are also a lot of question marks. And the question marks mean I don't even have enough data. The industry hasn't tested these commercial implementations broadly enough yet for me to even get to a mature idea of how this is going to work. But um, I think a lot of work is ahead of us there. So um, we talked about open source testing initiatives, another testing initiative that verifies commercial implementations and uh, is the new IP agency. We are uh, the, the test lab that currently works for the, for the new IP agency. I don't plan to be the only test lab working for the new IP agency, but for now we are we're piloting the program. And uh, it's a, this is a not-for-profit industry association, like many industry forums exist out there, and uh, its primary focus areas and goals are to educate the industry and to do industry-wide testing. So uh, we actually uh, take into, you know, we, we accept anybody from whoever, whichever camp or open source group they're coming, and uh, we test the commercialized implementations. 
So, uh, so, so far we've done uh, two major programs of uh, VNF to NFVI interoperability, which is like the, the light multi-vendor model, as I explained. And uh, this, in this interoperability, we validated different commercial virtualized network functions, interoperability with commercial NFE infrastructures. And uh, we started that in December 2015. We ran quite a few combinations. I'll, I'll explain which. And um, last year in the summer, we did a first showcase of the whole uh, heavy multi-vendor interoperability. I think it was really just like fireworks, <laughs> you know, to the, the first uh, first showcase in this area with some of our members. And uh, we're going to substantiate this with a more structured manual interoperability testing program starting um, right now. So basically we're testing the orchestrators, NFVOs and uh, VNFMs to, from one vendor group together with the infrastructure from a second vendor group together with VNFs from a third vendor group. So uh, that's going to be a, a lot of testing and requires automation as well. And in the blue circle, we also, part we as ENTC, not the new IP agency, but my company ENTC participated in the first Etsy plug test of the same area of the management and network orchestration. So to, to give you an impression of uh, how this, what this looks like, uh, we create a database as well. And uh, by the way, I'd, I'd love to interface with databases that open source projects um, maintain. I think that's part of the, the testing pipeline paradigm that we need to get the results stored in a kind of interoperable way. Um, so you see on the left-hand side, the VNFs on the top, you see the NFEIs, so these are the vendors that provided their solutions for our tests so far for the VNF to NFEI testing. And you see a number of passes, you see a number of NAs because we refused to test same vendor to same vendor. So we said like uh, this test combination is not available. They can do this internally. And there are still a lot of open empty slots. And these empty slots should not happen in the end, right? So in in a, a fully automated world, we should have all of this matrix filled. Uh, currently, most of the testing time is spent in configuring, adapting, and doing pre-staging. So it's not easy to automate all of it because of the many different ways how vendors configure their solutions. And um, we have to work on filling the empty slots. So the results were, were pretty good. I would say in general, so if you look at 36 vendor to vendor combinations passed, 17, 17 was failed or not completed due to time constraints, which means like we, vendors didn't completely give up, but they couldn't get things done within the time we had available for them. And that is a total success rate about, of about two thirds. I think that's, that's um, representative as far as I'm concerned. And of course, the success rate of tests always depends on how advanced the tests are. So if we would make the test too simple, of course, everybody could pass. Um, most people test lifecycle management these days, like onboarding VNFs, instantiating them, tearing them down, manipulating some operational parameters, and that's going to be, be that's becoming better. Uh, and uh, but we we plan I plan to keep the success level at around two thirds. I think that uh, means our, our tests are challenging enough and actually provide an added value. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah, good, good question. Thanks. So I, I'll repeat it for the microphone. So we are reporting only pass combinations and not failed combinations. The reason for that is that, um, you know, in in the commercial world, you always work under NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, and. The NDAs are sometimes a nuisance, but sometimes they're also great because under an NDA, a vendor is going to be much, much more open. So if you want to test something that's really innovative and really new, you have to sign an NDA and uh, then the vendor will disclose the latest and greatest. If we were to, f to prove to report failed combinations, we could not have these NDAs, which means the vendors would only bring their most proven, most well-established implementations, which are probably a year old, or they would not come at all. And so that's why we report only the past combinations. And the other reason is that in my experience in the industry, anybody who participates in the test and who fails something really wants to try to learn from it. 
I mean, that's the whole point, right? <laughs> uh, anything, you know, participating in a test campaign only to show past results is nice for marketing, but after all, it's a waste of money. So you really have to learn from the experience of failed tests. If we were, I mean, so the vendors that participate run back to their labs, fix this, and hopefully come back a couple of months later with the next campaign and pass more tests. The only ones that we should really worry about are the ones that are not mentioned here in the table at all because they didn't invest in the testing. So on this um, interoperability showcase that we ran at a uh, big communications event in Austin last year, we saw that uh, there is no two-dimensional matrix anymore. And that's the, one of the big problems with more advanced multi-vendor testing. So each of these little, okay, it's, it's barely readable, but each of these little uh, topology diagrams on the left-hand side, there are a total of six. They have multi-vendor combinations with the NFEI, with the VNFs, with the MANO. So you see it's a three-dimensional matrix for now. And testing a three-dimensional matrix is, of course, a huge more uh, ad, um, um, uh, added amount of work compared to a two-dimensional matrix. So that underlines, again, we need to automate the whole thing. And uh, the results were, were nice. Uh, there were a couple of implementations, interoperability uh, that worked, and especially we tested um, service chains of multiple VNFs um, chained or you know, you know, connected to each other in a forwarding graph and providing advanced services. We tested them in some cases even with uh, a, a MANO coming from a different vendor as the NFE infrastructure, and uh, we got a number of combinations going, and that's what we have to work on further to broaden this whole experience. Testing on an open source NFEI. Yes, of course. And uh, typically, our challenge is to get this supported. Because if we knock on the door of you know, OP NFE and say, like, are you supporting the, your implementation in terms of like sending engineers to a test and then fixing bugs you know, together with the vendors, this is not how open source projects normally work. Maybe, maybe we can change this. But in general, uh, typically, we require a vendor uh, who supports an open source implementation and uh, this vendor will then, you know, provide the support. We had thought about, you know, just taking a few servers and installing OPNFV, for example, or just a Colorado release or whatever uh, ourselves. But then the big question is, like, who is going to provide support for it? <laughs> like it's, it's a challenge. We, we managed to get the OPNFV um, into the, well, I guess it comes up soon in the Etsy um, plug test recently. Uh, but the only way to do that was for, for vendors to volunteer resources. So uh, Intel and Ericsson, for instance, volunteered a bunch of resources for a few weeks just to make sure that we could run the open source stuff in that context. It's, um, and then, of course, that, that was me that arranged the Ericsson side. And I got beaten because, you know, we spent money and what did we get out of it? Well, we actually got some good stuff out of it, but it's, it's difficult for a vendor to, to actually be able to say, okay, we need to spend you know, thousands of dollars on, on running this open source software here. It's... Uh, it's a non-trivial challenge, I guess. Yeah, so Ericsson joined the new IP agency, and I hope we'll, we'll see some OPNFE implementation there soon as well. OK, so upcoming is um, manual tests. And um, I'm just highlighting this because of the underlying test plans. So whenever you run a test, of course, there should be a test plan. And that's the big difference between a test and a plug fest. A plug fest or, you know, even further er, earlier in the pipeline, a, a hack fest is a lightly planned activity from my point of view. So you're basically relying on the experience of the participants. You're relying on their understanding of the relevance of what they do. On a hack fest even more and on a plug fest as well, you basically lock people into a room and hope that something worthwhile will come out if you throw a couple of topics at them. For, for our tests, we um, provide much more detailed test plans. And I think these test plans shall be available for the whole industry and not only for, for you know, a, a single test, again, speaking in favor of the, the pipeline paradigm. So um, in the new IP agency, we're not creating proprietary test plans. We're only creating open, open test plans. And we're doing this through the ATSI NFE industry specification group. So 
NIA, actually new IP agency, doesn't even have a technical committee by, by intention. <laughs> um, we say any resources uh, that are knowledgeable and can co contribute to a test plan should go to Etsy. So uh, I'm rapporteur for the Etsy TST007 document and it has nothing to do with James Bond and uh, it's it's actually an interoperability test plan for the management and network orchestration. So we are, it's currently in a, it's still in a so-called early draft, but we have like the tenth version of it, and we plan to get into a stable draft by the next Etsy meeting in May and uh, get it ratified before September or something. So it's in a pretty good shape. So what are the challenges of commercial implementations? Um, we published detailed test reports. You can read them on uipagency.com or on light reading or just Google. And um, interestingly, we saw a, a number, a fairly large number of issues. We documented them in detail. And then we had a, a call with the, with the OpenStack team, uh, I think it was two months ago. And I, I basically uh, listed all my challenges, and the response from from your colleagues was like, "Okay, this is an education challenge. This is a commercial adaptation challenge. Uh, this is, you know, uh, just a pure commercial issue." So um, we saw that this pipeline is really necessary because not all problems can be finger pointed back to open source. So what vendors do is they they take the code and they implement it sometimes on their own. I mean, a couple of vendors, of course, are looking more towards Red Hat or uh, Canonical now for like a centralized maintenance of at least the NFVI. But typically, vendors take code from open source and then they modify it. They, in the best case, they just you know, provide the modifications back. In the worst case, they branch off. And that typically means there are quite a few releases behind. So we tested a lot of uh, Kilo and Liberty release stuff last year which I'm not sure if it's still supported at all. You know, it's it's like old stuff from, from the OpenStack view, um, but from the telecom s vendor view, it's still, you know, what how fast they can work. And of course, you get into a version interoperability issues. You know, the, the one version doesn't work with the other, and the VNF assumes like uh, a more advanced environment. That's one thing. Then uh, another point is, uh, the the whole policy improvements, you know, security security aspect is always important for telecoms, and uh, it's implemented. Security aspects are implemented in OpenStack, but you know, the more restrictive you make uh, the isolation of tenants or services, the more you get into problems. So there was often an issue that we saw, and I think it was also mostly due to configuration or lack of understanding. But that's the reality today. And the last part is licensing. Etsy has now started some work on uh, licensing alignment. Naturally, commercial licensing is something that open source projects would not deal with traditionally, right? I mean, there are no licenses in open source. So why even start a project? And um, in reality, of course, in the commercial world, licenses are a big point. <laughs> and everybody does licensing in a different way. So we had a lot of issues with uh, VNFs not working because they, they lost contact to their license server or you know weird, weird things happening. So we, we hope to, be, um, to provide as much details as needed to reproduce and fix these issues back to open source where feasible. And um, to for all of the other parts, we just need to educate the vendor world and uh, tell the new joiners that uh, they should look at these aspects and try to avoid them. There's another another aspect to the to the implementation deviations. I guess if if you turn your mind back to when when Juno and Kilo were being developed, um, that was a period where a lot of telecommunications vendors were showing up at OpenStack and waving their hands in the air and saying, "Guys, this is terrible. We can't get anything done." Um, there there were and and that's indicative that there were gaps between what what the telecommunications industry required and what the OpenStack community had as a, as a foundation. Um, since then, I think there's been a lot of good work done um, by, by the OpenStack community and by the telecommunications company by stop waving their hands and actually getting down and, and contributing. But those gaps are closing between the need and, and what's available. And I think this is something which, which speaks uh, very strongly to open source in general in, in that we, we found a way to move forwards. We found a way to find a common foundation. 
um, and I would I would put money that we're not going to see the same interoperability issues that we have had traditionally because we've learnt and we iterate and we and we fix this moving forwards. And I, I, I would suggest from Mataka onwards, it's well, it will be smoother sailing for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So we're we're progressing with the topics, and I think mano interoperability is currently the issue. Um, towards the end of this year in Q4, we want to look at the integration of SDN and NFV in the telecom industry. Everybody always says SDN and NFV as if it is a six-letter acronym, but of course nobody really understands or few people understand what does it actually mean to create interoperability and to integrate an SDN orchestration and an NFV orchestration into a common end-to-end -end service. What happens, you know, if data center X failed and all of the associated paths like the SDN flows towards customers, they all need to be migrated to another data center together with the service for example. So that's my hope for 2018 to get something <laughs> working on a multi-vendor level there. And then one big area where I think a lot of interoperability challenges exist right now is resource management. Of course, service providers hope to be able to use um, their data centers in, an, in a flexible way, you know, to share workloads, um, to scale things up and down as the customer services require on the application level. And uh, that resource management doesn't really exist or doesn't work well today. I think it's it's probably we're probably due a short plug on the Open Network Automation Platform project, um, which is which is uh, for those that aren't familiar with it, it's it's being launched this week, I believe, um, formally. Uh, ONAP, ONAP. Um, it's it's essentially the network operators have come together and said, "Whoops." Um, they said, "Whoops." <laughs> 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 For very That's good reasons, good they weren't able to operate their networks. Um, but they've actually come together and, and collaborating on building an OSS, BSS, next-gen solution in, into the MANO layer as well. Um, and they're inviting the vendors to come along, and, and it's, it's, it's really an interesting dialogue to watch because this is where you know, AT&T, China Mobile, Orange, uh, Bell Canada, these guys are sort of getting there, and, and then they call up the, the Ericsson, Cisco's, Nokia's, and, and Huawei's, and, and say, we want to solve these problems, and, and can we do it together, and can we do it in such a way that it, that it helps to facilitate this integration that we have, um, so that you can actually start to talk about things like, if that data center fails because of an earthquake, how are these other data centers going to pick it up? And then you have a software base to actually start to articulate those conversations. Um, and this is kind of exciting. It, it, it's going to be slow going, is my prediction, because you're actually dealing with some really complex topics, but it, it should help with this. Right. And I mean, number one is always requirement analysis. And I'm not sure if the service providers all agree. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of organizations understand their own business and technical requirements for operating their services. But how much the industry can align on this, um, it's, it's an interesting challenge. Good. Okay, just if, uh, two more things on the... Etsy plug test that we participated in, so it's not an ENTC or a new IP agency initiative, it's an Etsy initiative. Etsy uh, runs some, some uh, tests themselves, and this plug test um, allowed both commercial and open source implementations to participate. So here we have an example of a case where vendors delegated staff to officially support open source initiatives to participate. Uh, it was a fairly large crowd there and it was actually a face-to-face in-person in test event. Um, the, the test that we conducted uh, with a new IP agency, they are mostly remote and distributed. We, ha we counted a total of 85 vendor engineers participating in one of the campaigns, but we only saw 13 of them ever on site. So uh, this is a face-to-face -face test event and they tested um, MANO as well, so bus focusing mostly on the uh, VNF lifecycle management, network service lifecycle management. Uh, next slide. So plug test participants are quite a few uh, grouped into the VNFs on the left-hand side, the MANOS on the center, and the infrastructure on the right-hand side. And I tried to color those in yellow that are open source. Apologies if the yellow doesn't come out the same. I didn't. I felt. Was, I failed fighting with Google Docs here uh, in, in the colors, but basically you see everything that's open on the left-hand side, uh, open baton, open O, open source MANO, uh, and OPNFV, open VIM, open stack platform. Uh, so, so basically uh, these are open source based or direct open source implementations that participated. 
and uh, from the results, they had a, a, a very positive outcome. So uh, around like 97, 98% of all combinations were okay. And I think, again, this is due to the fact that vendors who uh, started testing and they figured it would fail, they just didn't report it. And um, so that's what you have to deal with. The Etsy plug tests have a different focus than the new IP agency. New IP agency says we want to report anything and we will actually log everything on, you know, my, my team logs all the results and there's no way to escape this. In the Etsy plug test, it's an engineering focused event. They don't publish detailed results. This is the, the only results that are available on, on the actual implementation level. And uh, they say this is, if the vendors don't want to report it, then it's it's their own deal. I think on, on the open source side, I know for OPNV, the approach was that if we find a fault, we run everything, and if we find a fault, we raise a ticket, right? So mm -hmm. Right, yes. yeah, yeah, sure. We're there to learn. Good. And again, you know, the main benefit is learning, right? It's not about like finger pointing or blaming or something. And, and that's, of course, uh, on the commercial marketing side, that's always a conflict of goals. You know, if you, if you learn, then you want to be as much failing as possible to learn from it. If you want to be great on marketing, you have to be able to publish a press release. Like we, fa we completed thousands of combinations successfully. And uh, these are different goals. Good. Um, so we have uh, 20 minutes left, 19 minutes left. I'm going to quickly talk a little bit about the vendor challenges that we have. Um, and we can more or less stop and, and take questions as, as well. Uh, we, don't, we don't have a lot of time remaining. We've done pretty well thus far. But um, I did want to cover two main points. One is when it comes to building um, an interoperable application, Back when I was building applications in before this NFV time, um, it was great. You, you bought a box, you put an operating system on it, you built your software, you put that on top of it, you then tested it, and you knew it worked. And you could go out to a customer, you could put it into the wall and plug it on and switch it on, and it would work just the way it did when you built it. And life was relatively OK. Um, I, remember I know, the good old <laughs> days. <laughs> yeah. Um, now we're in a virtual environment. Now, now I, I, I don't even know what the box I'm running on looks like anymore, let alone have control of which operating system that I'm running on. So, so the world changes a little bit. But even though I'm in a world where, where I don't necessarily have the same foundation, I still have certain expectations when it comes to selling my software. I need to be able to provide predictable performance, predictable scalability, um, and predictable operability, which we talked a little bit about um, thus far. I need to be able to, an operator, someone buying my software needs to be able to use it. Um, and, and that's fine if the software is relatively simple, but the more complex the software gets, the more it has dependencies on the traffic coming in or going out of it. Um, and the more it's government regulated, the more challenging that becomes. Um, it also needs to be lifecycle managed. So I don't necessarily know what operating system I'm running on or what's, what is lifecycle managing my software. However, it needs to still work effectively as a lifecycle managed object. It needs to be able to be upgraded. It needs to operate in a resilient manner. Um, it, it needs to have methods of reporting and methods of getting input that are well understood regardless of where it's running. Um, and this is, this is a huge challenge. And we talk about how it was with Juno and, and, and we were running on VMware or it was Red Hat this or Canonical that. And, and they were all very different a few years ago and it was you literally had to do everything over and over and over again, depending on what your target was. Um, and that's what we need to move away from, because if I write a 1,000 lines of code, I want to be able to sell a 1,000 lines of code. I don't want to be able to sell a 1,000 lines of code and 3 million lines of tests because I have 20 platforms I have to hit. Then it's not worth making the software. Um, the other is, is interoperability, of course. Um, standard interfaces, so it, it, it doesn't matter what I'm running on, it doesn't matter where I'm running it, I still need to provide the same standard interfaces, otherwise the phone can't connect to the system. Um, you know, there's, there's some basic things that we still have to maintain and bring forward, and predictable characteristics. If there's too much lag, it's not going to work. If there's too much delay, it's not going to work. If there's enough throughput, it's not going to work for the services that consumers want to buy. So from a vendor perspective, um, life sucks right now, I think is the best way I can describe it. Um, but it's getting better, and it's getting better because of a lot of the things we've talked about today. I think if I'm an operator, I'm thinking of buying. I want to buy. What do I expect when I'm buying? Well, I expect to be able to click to buy. I would love this to be in an app store type of thing. I want to press that button and I want it to be up and running and I want a new um, you know, horizontal service deployed. That's cool. Um, in fact, that's an awesome target and that's the target we have in mind 
um, when we build things these days. That's where we're trying to go. Um, but it's, it's kind of challenging. We need application portability. It needs to be able to run on this cloud or that cloud, and that cloud can be data center cloud or central office cloud, and it can be running different, different versions of an, of an operating system. We still need to be able to manage this. The management and orchestration layer needs to be able to tell my application where to run, and I should just follow the marching orders and go and run where I meant to run. Um, functions, of course, have to be interoperable. And the tricky part is it has to be multi-vendor. In other words, everyone else has to be able to do the same thing that we're doing. Um, and that's, that's where it gets really tricky because unless it's available in an open and, and common way, which is what open source is all about, it's very hard for us to all approach a problem with the same mindset. Um, and end-to-end -end automation, of course, comes into it. So we have this little arrow I have on the side, and, and it really talks about the foundation pieces, doing the common things in open source, using uh, the interop working group in OpenStack, using the CVP in open, OPNV, and, and pushing things there. As a vendor, I want to push as much there as I can, because if I can push stuff there, then I can start to answer some of the questions of where is my application going to land? What is it going to be running on? Um, what are the interfaces it has to use? The more certain I can be about that, the faster I can write software. Um, and the more certain I can be about deploying that software. So really, we, we talked earlier about pushing a lot of the testing back down the track. Um, it's really important as an operator, if you're thinking about buying a particular system, if you know how that system should look, find the earliest possible point in that chain to get that test running so that operators, or so that, so that vendors trying to sell you that can, can hit that context as early as possible. Um, then, of course, things like Etsy and a VTST, it's a standard for testing. This is how we're going to test. This is how we're going to be measured. And we can all sort of align and agree on that. It's relatively straightforward, and it, and it provides us with a really nice foundation for coming out to a customer and saying, we followed this. And the customer's like, oh, good. Now I know, now I know what you've done. Um, and I'm relatively comfortable with that. Uh, then some of the vendor activities, NV, NVIOT is up there, and that's, that's been around for, for a long time now. That's, that's where all the vendors got together and we said, okay, I've got an EPG and I've got an MME and I've got all these sorts of things, and we plug them together and we make sure they work as vendors. Um, and that helps us solve that interoperability challenge. What it hasn't traditionally done is made them all virtual activities and, and run them in different data centers and things like that. Um, so there is a new initiative called the NFV ITI, which is, which is looking at addressing how we can get those applications running on each other's softwares and hardwares, which is, which is in, in a similar area to the, the, the certification work or compliance work that, that um, the new IP agency does. So a, a lot of this sort of feeds up to the point where you get to that commercial readiness piece, right? You, you do need to do the interoperability testing before you go to someone's lab to certify that it works. You need to know that it works. You need to know that it works based on what you've pushed into open source so that you know that the applications and interfaces you're going to work, you're going to use, are going to actually feed into that. So it's, it's kind of a, a, a chain that we see um, which comes to the point of where and how do I achieve click to buy? Um, how do I make it easy for operators to iterate? Because if operators can iterate quickly, if operators can click a button, have a virtual network spun up, and be able to test that safely in a secure, isolated environment, me as a, a software vendor, I can start to have a conversation with them about how much lifecycle management I have to invest in, how, how much backward compatibility has to be through every component in the stack. Where can I start to do stuff quicker so that they can start to do stuff quicker? It's a cycle that we have to get into. Uh, and it's not the vendors and it's not the operators alone that have to do this. We, we have to get together, we have to collaborate, and we have to find the ways to make this um, faster, uh, better. And, and all of these interoperability challenges that we're working with all feed into that. And by the way, the application layer is an interesting point that shouldn't be underestimated. In the beginning, everybody saw, well, the application layer doesn't change. You know, if a vendor had a virtual, uh, an EPC implementation before, they just take it and they port it, and then it's cloud, cloud, something. Uh, but no. it's actually only cloud ready, maybe. Uh, it's not cloud native, and I understood the difference can be pretty major in terms of like a cl cloud ready implementation can be pretty monolithic. It doesn't really take any of the major benefits of the virtualization. It just you know says like okay now we can run it somehow in the cloud, and uh, on the way to getting cloud native, um, the application needs to change quite dramatically in some cases. So all the application layer needs to be retested. Yeah, anyone, ra raise your hands if you've tried to run a diameter stack across a thousand containers. Um, 
Yeah, you'd be insane to do so. No, you wouldn't. You'd, but it, these are the types of challenges that we have to address. When when we were standardizing around diameter, we weren't thinking of spinning up 500 containers here and 5,000 containers over there and that they should all interoperate. That wasn't part of how we envisioned the network working. Uh, so this changes across the stack. As you say, the application level adjusts. Um, but from a vendor perspective, I mean, I, I come back to the ONS harmonize, harness, consume. This is, this is really the message. This is, <laughs> it's spot on for where we are as an industry at this point in, the in, at, in time. I mean, we, we need to find ways of harmonizing around the interfaces, the environments, the processes, the workflows. Uh, we need to figure out how to make the most of the software that's available to us, and then we need to get that into the network as quickly as possible. And this, this cycle of harness, harmonize, consume is what we need to speed up. Um, and that's, that's really what all of this is about. That's why we want CD, why we want CI, why we want interop, why we want automation. That's, that's what's going to help. Um, so that's the vendor's view, I guess, on, on where we want to go. Um, the vendor's view on, on how much effort it's going to cost to get there is, is maybe not as shiny. Um, but we're still okay. So um, that's really all I wanted to talk about from my perspective. We have a few, we have 10 minutes for questions. Um, and we have a concluding slide. So, any questions? yeah, any questions? Otherwise, I'll ask my fellow panelists questions, which you don't want to see happen. Oh, sorry. Is there a question? No, no, just uh, well, we'll repeat it. Is there a uh, work somewhere like where's the best place to work on a template? Since there's universal templates for onboarding virtual functions and wrapping them into additional metadata, but if we're all uh, so the question was, was where do we go to work on that universal template that helps us onboard applications, wrap them in processes and policies, and, and allow us to click to buy? Um, there is some work being done in, in Tosca uh, by, by Etsy. Um, there, is, there is work being done in the newly forming ONAP project. Um, and then there is a lot of work being done. I mean, you know, Products like Juju and other products have done a lot of work around this. Um, but that universal template that agreed on, this is how we're going to do it, um, that's a work in progress at this point. We don't, we don't have something we can point at and say, there, there we go. Um, and the reason is it's a, it's a tough question to answer. It's, and, and there are a lot of things that, you know, if, if Ericsson sat down to try and do it, and we even talked to Nokia, and we agreed on how we do it, and we can bring Huawei in and Cisco in, and we can sort of agree on how to do it. We're still only addressing 40% of what it needs to do. It's, it's, it's a big industry question. Um, but I, I hope to see Etsy, I hope to see the ONAP project, um, I hope to see the work being done in Tosca sort of over the next 12 months or so really start to answer some of these questions and give us, you know, at least 80% of what we need to get there. That, that would be ideal. And the team forum, of course. Yes. All right, quickly. Definitely. And I think we are we're seeing something um, maybe a little further down the stream in the SDN, on the SDN transport side of things. So uh, in SDN implementations have adopted NetConf and Yang models to describe to describe the, the services. And uh, the, the challenge there is always to find a Yang model, which is multi-vendor ready. Everybody has their own Yang model. Like everybody had their own SNMP MIP in the old days. And um, that, of course, of course, not going to help much. Because even if you agree on the protocol, like NetConf to exchange it, that's only half of the game, right? So hats off uh, to any initiative here that's trying to harmonize the models. because they're going to find a way for vendors to still differentiate from each other because vendors can't differentiate anymore. They can't sell their services anymore, their solutions. And uh, at the same time, standardize the model sufficiently enough to make life easier for service providers. Game for me. 
So I was curious, you had that sort of graph, the up and to the right graph, and, and if there's a place that OPNV fits in there somewhere, you know, you went right from open source right into, it seemed like, yeah. vendor. Um, yeah, you, actually I've got the logo down here next to OpenStack. Um, it, it's, it's actually interesting because OPNV is a little further down the line than OpenStack, but when it comes to how as a vendor, you remember, how I as a vendor approach doing this, OPNV is still before I try and productify something. So for me, it's still part of that pre-design cycle. Um, it's kind of open source integration and open source consolidation. So I, I do have it down here in the open source interoperability piece. Um, yeah, we can. it can be debated. It was a quickly put together slide. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we weren't sure about the the sequence, so it's not a strict order. So if yeah. you if you take screenshot of this, don't say like this comes before the other because uh -huh. the NFE ITI people uh, where they were somewhere here. Yeah, so they they're here. But I, I, as far as I understood, the initiative it's often you know working with service providers and avoiding like the finger pointing to it's it's a, it's an MOU that says like if we find like we ex the vendors find ourselves in in the same service provider and our versions of our software doesn't work with each other then we do not finger point we actually help each other and uh, that's that's you know sounds trivial but it's a major f achievement and uh, so the, the pipeline might not be in the right order but in any way it's i think it underlines the whole paradigm Thing and we have to sort out how this would work. More questions? Do you see containers creating even more problems as they start to get more popular? Docker, Kubernetes? <laughs> um, well, um, from OpenStack perspective, uh, we are trying to um, support uh, containers as much as possible. Uh, we are seeing containers uh, be a hot topic from multiple perspectives, not just, uh, that can be, there's an initiative that that's easily get the, the fingers pointed at from the perspective of, oh, we just put our things into containers and then it will solve our problems because then that will most probably will make it cloud ready slash native slash cloud dash uh, star. Uh, it's not actually true. Um, so um, containers um, are not equal to solve our problems out of the box that we didn't spend time and energy and effort on, on solving it. So from this perspective, I think containers are even a, a bigger challenge. So it's not how the technologies fit together, but how the mindset uh, will be ready uh, to deal with containers. Um, on the other hand, um, we also see containers, for example, f in uh, in HPC and, and scientific workloads. Uh, like, for example, I don't want my researcher to be uh, an engineer and do all the all the infrastructure layer coding because it's not the, the main purpose. So there's another area where where containers can can come into the picture. But we are just dealing with the uh, same slash similar issues than than how we are dealing with with the VMs and how we are onboarding it. Um, exactly, and <laughs> um, I, from, from a, again, the vendor's perspective, from a vendor's perspective, actually, it can, it can help and it can hinder depending on what the challenge you're facing is. It, it helps in that I just have to target a kernel version that I want to run on and I, and I don't have to necessarily worry about host and, and guest uh, interoperability and KVM versions and stuff like that anymore. Um, it can hinder... Uh, not so much in the container itself, but the container control plane and how that interacts with my, with my, for instance, OpenStack control plane uh, and how I couple these things together. Uh, the networking is, is, well, we have some work to do on, on networking when it comes to how we're adopting and working with containers. There is some great work on, on the KAS stuff um, about, about how to bring some of the Kubernetes stuff into OpenStack. Um, I, I see a lot of really good progress. And if, if we continue to make that progress, I don't think they're going to be a huge problem for us. Um, something like OCI, Open Container Initiative, gives us a standard packaging format. I, when, when containers first came out, we were like, yay, we have a new version of a tarball, uh, because that's really what they provided you, a way to package up stuff 
um, and, and you didn't have to untar it to run it. You just downloaded it and run it, and it was perfect. Um, it's, it's moved on from there. When we talk about containers, we now talk a little more about control planes and networking and how they interact and, and, and how they scale. Um, and it's that control plane part where I think we, we, we can need to continue to invest. Um, but in general, I'm actually very supportive of containers and how they can help us with interoperability. Um, if all I have to worry about is my is my my OCI format, and all I have to worry about is that I have a compatible kernel, um, and as long as I can trust that the control plane is relatively co cohesive to what I expect, I, I think from a, a deployment perspective, it can help simplify. And I, we may be out of time, so I'll let these guys wrap up. That's me done. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so thank you all for coming. This is what we had for interoperability for today. Uh, but as you could hear, it's uh, we don't have the conclusion. Uh, we are not ready with everything. So I would like to encourage all of you to uh, look up the uh, related uh, open and open source activities and, and join there and provide feedback, uh, participate, write test cases uh, or code, uh, and just share your experience with us, because this is what will uh, bring uh, us and uh, the industry forward. Yeah, well, closing words. Thanks very much for attending, and I hope it was useful. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. And you can, you can find us around the whole week. If